So I grew up in a very athletic family, uh, a sports-obsessed family, actually. My mother is, uh, exercises every day of her life and ran in three triathlons. My father is a high school physical education teacher. Um, he's a very successful basketball coach as well. He coached here at McMaster for 18 years and also with the Canadian national team. My brother is an extremely talented athlete at just about every sport. Uh, he's the captain of the basketball team here at Mac. And my sister, not to be outdone, is uh, a six foot tall volleyball player here at McMaster. Naturally, I participated in sports all of my life. And I sucked. <laughs> not only was I unsuccessful at all of the sports I participated in, but I hated gym class. Gym class was like hell for me. I just didn't fit into that entire environment um, and felt pretty alone and pretty um, unsuccessful in an environment that valued physical activity and, and athletic excellence. And I just wasn't one of those people. Um, so I decided to uh, give up on physical activity altogether uh, and join the gym, which was a terrible decision. I didn't really enjoy being at the gym. The gym was kind of like, uh, the gym was kind of like gym class on steroids. I, I really disliked it, and one day I decided that I wasn't going to, going to go to the gym anymore, that I was just going to quit. And on my way out, I saw a Hatha yoga class occurring. And Hatha just means a system of postures, a system of meditation, and a system of breath, of breath work. So usually when we say yoga in North America, we mean Hatha yoga. So I walk into this class and we started breathing and we started stretching and we started moving and I fell in love. Six years later, I'm a certified yoga teacher and my life has completely changed. Uh, yoga just made so much sense to me. Uh, you know, you begin a class with this centering breath work, you begin to move, you begin to sweat, you begin to really find your boundaries, you begin to push them and maybe you begin uh, to move back when you've moved too far. You really get to know yourself when you're all twisted up in eagle pose or lying on your back in shavasana. You walk out of yoga class feeling like a dream. And I didn't get that same feeling from the physical activities or the sports that I participated in. But you don't have to choose one or the other. Growing up around athletes made me realize that there was a really great opportunity here to marry the teachings of yoga with sports, and that this could begin to address some of these problems inherent in physical activity. I believe that we need to change the way we participate in physical activity and in traditional athletic systems, and I believe that yoga provides a framework for making physical activity and sports more sustainable, more successful, more enjoyable. I believe a lot of these problems start out right in our own gym classes. In grade nine, we ask young people to come into a gym to run laps around um, in front of their teachers, in front of their friends, at one of the most physically awkward times in their life. Most of those students, especially the ones who maybe don't fit into the mold of a gym class athlete like I didn't, probably will never take another physical education class again. And who could blame them? This quote was given to me in my grade nine phys ed class. The purpose of physical fitness is to be physically able to react in case of an emergency. For example, to run away if an attacker is chasing you. <laughs> so forget about the fact that, you know, it's so much better for our immune systems, our cardiovascular systems, and that young people who participate in sports are healthier and happier and more likely to have successful educational outcomes. Clearly, the priorities of phys ed are a little bit off base. Currently, those who do commit fully to athletic excellence spend large amounts of time competing, participating, and training. Uh, they, they may practice in the off-season, they may cross-train, spend evenings watching game films, and it is no secret, secret that athletic burnout is a very common reality. So these two polars of athletic participation present some of the, what I believe are the two fundamental problems with physical activity. First is that athletic goals and physical activities are standardized. We ask young people to perform, in, for example, in gym class, a certain amount of a physical activity, like a sit-up or a push-up, based on their age and gender, without regard for uh, their individual body types and their own physical needs. Second, elite athletes engage in sport-specific training and, in doing so, may experience burnout for their individual sport. And I believe that the practice of yoga, especially hatha yoga, begins to answer or provide solutions for some of these problems. 
One example of how these problems manifest themselves in our gym classes is through the use of sit-ups uh, in order to strengthen the body's core. Sit-ups are not for everyone. In fact, some studies have shown that sit-ups actu are actually harmful for the low back. They may not effectively strengthen the body's core. And a number of groups of firefighters across North America have completely eliminated them from their training regimen due to strain it causes in the neck. And so we're asking young people in gym class to do a certain number of physical act or a certain number of sit-ups and record how many you can do and then compare it to a standard. When a lot of these, when, when sit-ups may not work for a lot of these students. So the practice of Hatha Yoga would say, instead of assigning this standardized activity, let's look for a number of different movements that strengthen the body's core, not just sit-ups, and see what works best for you, and then begin to really practice those movements. So instead of a sit-up, you might do a plank, or if a plank's not working for you, you might do a tabletop pose or a modified plank or you might take a boat pose to strengthen the core, or you might come into a tree pose. And in a tree pose, or in any of these postures, you really begin to uh, find beneficial and safe alignment. And once you've found that beneficial and safe alignment, you can begin to engage and lengthen certain muscle groups and find ease in even the most challenging postures. Yoga is non-judgmental and yoga is non-competitive and this is one of um, my favorite parts about yoga and one of the ways I think it can really apply to the way we teach physical activity. Yoga accepts that from day to day our bodies might feel different. One day you may, may feel great in a plank and the next day you need to take tabletop. Uh, and one of the places where this is most obvious, this, ver this daily variation, is in our own posture. So most of us kind of walk around with this rounded spine, this like thoracic kyphosis where you're shoulders are rounded forward, your head slouched forward, and our daily lives contribute to this. For example, if you're at your desk, you're typing, your shoulders are rounded forward. If you're texting, your shoulders are rounded forward, or you're driving. And even conventional forms of physical activity, you're riding your bike, or you're running, or you're getting low in basketball, or you're getting low in volleyball. And all of these things begin to contribute to really tight chest muscles, and really weak back muscles, and by hunching over, we're limiting the amount of space that our lungs have to expand. So let's do some yoga to explore this now. Since we're all seated, we'll stay seated. And if you can't do this, don't worry. Just even thinking about it can, seem, can sometimes be very powerful. So let's sit up really tall in your chair. And really ground your sit bones into your chair. Bring the backs of the hands onto your knees. Point the crown of your head up towards the ceiling. Draw your shoulders up back and down, and then draw your shoulder blades together behind you. Draw your low belly in towards your spine, and notice if you're sticking your ribs out and draw them back in. Close your eyes and take a deep exhale. Just exhale all the air out of your lungs. And let's inhale through our nose together for a count of one, two, three, and exhale through the nose. Two, three, and you can open your eyes. So this little mini yoga class helps us to recognize where our bodies are at every day and then determine the proper yoga postures or the extent of your yoga postures to begin to bring it back into optimal alignment. And I believe that this philosophy of recognizing that our bodies change from day to day and we need to respond to this can really revolutionize the way we're teaching physical education. If instead of telling young people to do a certain amount of a certain type of activity a certain number of times, why not provide them with options and give them permission to decide what works best for them. And then once we do, maybe they can pick a, a, choose a physical activity that they love and participate in that physical activity for as long as they want in any extent that they want. But yoga isn't all about the body, and I believe that in the mind is one of the places where yoga can most benefit competitive athletes. For example, athletes, especially in very competitive seasons, are under a lot of stress, and yoga has been demonstrated to decrease severe anxiety and stress in a number of studies, not just this one. I've also seen in my own teaching that yoga can um, really enhance an athlete's ability to uh, accept or to uh, enhance their sport-specific skills. As Eugen Harigal, the author of Zen in the Art of Archery, explains, in the case of archery, the hitter and the hit are no longer two opposing objects, but are one reality. And this kind of points to the experience that others have since described of getting into a flow or getting in the zone. And I believe that yoga provides one of the best ways to get our athletes into this space. 
So I decided to test this theory. As my undergraduate thesis here at McMaster, I tested the athletic recovery process in elite athletes, uh, especially studying the men's basketball team and the women's volleyball team. Over the course of 10 days, half of each team participated in yoga, the other half did not, and on every third day, the athletes completed a recovery stress profile to give me an idea of where they were at physically and mentally and emotionally. So before I even get into the results, just the experience of teaching the athletes yoga was a huge learning process for me, a great learning experience. And it really pointed to how yoga and sport have been so separated by culture. One of my favorite experiences uh, was once after the men's basketball game, a men's basketball home game. We hadn't done our yoga that, that day, so we all went over to the athletic center. And picture this, we have seven big basketball players, these huge guys decked out in their jerseys, standing there with hands at heart center, eyes closed, and namaste, just like really focusing on their yoga practice. And now picture all the people who've poked their heads in and are like, what the heck is going on? And it just kind of pointed to this idea that yoga and sport are so separate, are such separate cultures, and that this experience of merging them together provided a really cool opportunity. And the results are very exciting. The athletes who were doing yoga showed increased or improved physical recovery and social recovery. They experienced lower le levels of fatigue than their non-yoga counterparts, lower rates of injury, and increased perceptions of their own athletic shape. And all of these results were uh, statistically significant. So in terms of physical recovery, blue line is the yoga group, red line is the, non is the control, the non-yoga group. And after the four time periods, after the 10 days, the yoga group had, much impro had improved their physical recovery greatly, while the non-yoga group kind of remained stagnant. Similar results were shown for the female volleyball players, except that most of the change happened in the last time period. But still, this blue line yoga group demonstrates higher physical recovery for the athletes participating in yoga. In terms of fatigue, again, red line control, blue line uh, yoga group. And after the, at the end of the time period, the stress levels of the non-yoga group had increased, or rather, sorry, the fatigue had increased. Uh, and this makes a lot of sense. It was right during their playoffs, one of the most competitive times in their season. So you would expect to see these kinds of results. Yet the yoga group actually decreased their fatigue. In terms of perceptions of athletic shape, blue line yoga group increased their perceptions of their own athletic shape compared to the athletes who weren't doing yoga. And on the female, for the female volleyball players, by the fourth time period, or the last day, the athletes who were not doing yoga experienced more injuries or felt more injury prone than the athletes who were not doing yoga. So I believe that, so for me, these quantitative results are really exciting, but even more exciting to me is the qualitative results that went along with them. The athletes really appreciated and really enjoyed adding these 20 minutes of yoga or 30 minutes of yoga into their day. And many continue to do yoga even now, even though the study's over. My brother and my sister, the super athletes, have really bought into the idea of yoga and really find it an integral process of their own athletic growth. Um, I believe that there's very exciting opportunities here for further research. I'm currently just finishing up my undergraduate thesis, but I'm very excited about how we can begin to merge yoga with sports and the exciting results. Um, I think this provides an entirely different spin on athletic medicine. Currently, athletic medicine falls under a conventional medical approach. It's reductionist in nature, and it tends to focus on one area of the body. For example, taping up your ankle if it's sprained. These techniques are faster in onset, and they're best at dealing with acute problems. The treatments tend to be standardized, involve little learning on the part of the patient, and everything is diagnosed through tests. In terms of a conventional medicine approach, especially to sports medicine, health is determined by an absence of injury or by negative test scores. And I believe that yoga as medicine begins to really fill in a lot of these gaps uh, and is a key missing component in the athletic medicine process. Yoga as medicine is holistic. It looks at the entire body and all of the body's interactions as well as with the mind. It's slower in onset. It's not as good at dealing with acute problems, but it's much better at dealing with chronic problems, especially things like psychosomatic illness and targets suffering as well as pain. Treatments are highly tailored to the individual and involve much learning on the part of the patient. And health by yoga standards is defined as an optimal level of physical, mental, and emotional well-being. 
Yoga should not be an adjunct to physical activity or to sports or a one-week unit in gym class. Rather, yoga is a whole approach to physical activity. Yoga teaches us to find our edge, to approach it, to notice when we've gone too far, and then back off. One of my favorite quotes in yoga is, if you can't, do it, don't. But if you can, you must. We can't continue to accept physical activity that discourages participation or that limits athletic potential. We can begin to apply the teachings of yoga to begin to make athletic participation and sports more sustainable, more successful, and more enjoyable. And we must do this to ensure a happy, healthy future. Thank you. Namaste.